Hi, welcome to Prodi Valley Church at home. I'm Brent, I'm one of the pastors here at Prodi Valley Church. It's great to have you joining our online teaching. We do believe though that for the church to be the church, it really means gathered community and connection to others. If you're visiting, I'd love you to scan the QR code that is on screen right now, and it'll help us to connect you into one of those midweek communities where you can be nurtured, prayed with and prayed for, and where you can be sent out into your neighborhood, into your workspace to make a difference for Jesus' sake. Secondly, we'd love to plug you into one of our serving opportunities. There are just countless spaces in the life, work and ministry in the church and out from the church into the broader community. And we'd love to take what you have been given by God and somehow leverage it to make Jesus' name known amongst the nations. And so we'd love you to connect with us in those ways. If you want any further information, do plug into our online platforms. Uh, our website, proteavalleychurch.org, has all the information you could need and you can connect to us from there. We're going to head straight into last Sunday's online teaching and so let me pray. Father and Son and Spirit, thank you so much for the gift of your great love for us that was exhibited by you creating us, molding us and shaping us in the image of God. Thank you too, Jesus, that you exhibited love for us when you died for us in our place on the cross and that you have allowed us to have the promise of eternal life. But until the day arrives when we are gifted that final gift of eternal life, Lord, we want to be found about the stuff of your kingdom, seeing your kingdom come here on earth. And so may this time of teaching equip us and train us and make us useful for you. And so we ask your blessing now and we ask this in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. We're working through Titus. Uh, I was reflecting the other day, I've never preached out of Titus before. So I've been a pastor, I've lost count 30 odd years. This is the first time I'm embarrassed to say I'm actually preaching out of the text. That's not cool. Uh, so we're going to make that right. We're preaching out of Titus chapter 2. So if you haven't been with us the last few weeks, Brent's been leading us into it. Just a reminder that uh, Titus is a, one of pa Paul's pastoral epistles. That's the big fancy language written by Paul. Uh, by epistle, we kind of mean it's a kind of letter. It's not language you use today, but it's kind of an, an, a, a formal a teaching letter. And that's where the pastoral side comes in. What, what Paul's trying to do is coach this young leader Titus into how he leads his congregation. So the situation is Crete. Uh, it's a, a little, small little fledgling Christian community that's been birthed in Crete, which we gather uh, from other, other parts of Scripture, as well as Titus himself writing about it. So just really a debauched, sinful city. The people there are, are renowned for being dishonest and thieves and just not a nice bunch of people. So if you said to someone, you're a cretin, you were, you were not saying something very nice about them. And so in this really messed up little city, uh, this people of God is born. And Titus is the one that's leading them. And so what Paul does is he writes this letter to this pastor to give him some direction into how he, how he teaches and how he nurtures this community of faith. And so Candice is going to come forward and read for us from the, well, Titus 2, the whole chapter which is fortunately not too long. You, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, 
so that in every way that will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. For the grace of God has approved, has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. These, then, are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Thanks, Candice. Let's uh, pray briefly. This is the word of God, which we ask you, Holy Spirit, to use to shape our thinking and to shape our hearts, our values, our lifestyle, that we might be the people of God uh, that you called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So we had a hockey meeting at school uh, this week and was thrilled to hear that uh, we're actually going to be able to stand on the sidelines and watch some hockey games. I don't know, that there's some, quite a lot of parents in the room. Here, one of the things we missed, I think, over the last two years is being able to just stand on the sideline and just, and the grandparents here are exactly the same probably, just cheer our kids on, just support them, uh, be there for them. And so it seems like that's coming back again. I'm looking forward to standing next to the hockey field and just watching my, my boys play. It gives me always joy and, and delight to, to see this. I've got, I've got sons who all play different sports, but hockey is the one that does keep them all together. They all three play hockey. I, I have kind of, kind of happy memories of grade one. Have you ever seen a grade one hockey match or a rugby match? It's hysterical. You just see the swarm of kids kind of moving around the field like this. There's no positional play whatsoever. Wherever the ball is, there's 22 or 30 players. And it's hysterical to watch. And one of the first things that a coach has to do is try and work with these little grade oneers to try and get them to play with some sort of structure. Impossible job. But there's normally three instructions, I think, that a coach would give uh, these little grade one boys and girls who play rugby and hockey. Uh, the one is play in one direction. That's the way you've got to go. All of you just hit the ball that way. If you're going that way, you're going to score an own goal. So play in one direction. Play hockey. If it's hockey you're playing, don't play rugby. Don't play netball. Don't pick up the ball. Don't tackle the oak. Play hockey. And the third instruction is don't hit anyone. So that's normally the three instructions any coach will give on the first day of hockey practice. Play in one direction. Play hockey, nothing else, and don't hit anyone. Now, I think Paul is looking at this little baby young church, like a grade one church, and he's kind of looking at the mess of this little congregation, and he's saying to Titus, you need to coach these guys. You need to give them some sense of direction. You need them to, to understand what it is that they're, they're doing as a people of God, what that looks like. And he says there, you, however, must teach or speak, depending on which translation you use, you, however, must teach or speak what is appropriate to sound doctrine. And so he begins to unfold and unpack for Titus what it is that he needs to teach this little young congregation of older women, older men, younger women, younger men, slaves and masters. What does it look like to be the people of God, to be a community that just looks different to this Cretan society <clears throat> excuse me, that you're part of? Now, <clears throat> he lists a whole bunch of stuff for the, the, the older women and some stuff for the older men and some stuff for the younger men and the younger women and the slaves. I don't think those are definitive. I don't think those are things that we need to perhaps focus on this morning. I think that if Paul was writing a church to Protea Valley, he's writing this letter to Protea Valley, he would list different stuff because he's trying to speak into the context and into the situation. So what we want to do this morning is rather look at a bigger picture of the text. And I think it's not too different to a hockey match. I think there are three things that, that Paul is kind of saying to Titus, you need to coach this young congregation into. And they're the same, interestingly, as hockey, I think. First thing he would say to Titus is teach them to play in the same direction. Teach them to play in one direction. You don't need me to tell you this, but we live in a world which encourages play in any direction nowadays. We call it relativism. So we live in a world which increasingly says, whatever game you want to play, you play it. Whatever is true for you, that's your truth. Whatever you believe is acceptable for your life, that's your, that's your life. So you, how can I judge you? Because you're allowed to believe that. And so 
It's just chaos out there because everyone is just playing according to their own set of rules. And in fact, whatever the latest fad is on social media, so people are just chasing after that. And so there's no sense of truth. There's no sense of what's right. There's an increasing lack of what is wrong. And it's chaos out there as a result. So I think one of the things that Paul would say to us through myself as pastor of this little congregation is, guys, play in one direction. I'm very aware with three teenage boys that particularly around issues of gender and sexuality, there are just so many voices pulling in so many different directions. And yet when we hear Jesus, he seems to have quite clarity within himself about that there is a truth and there is a way. In fact, he says, I am the way and the truth. And Scripture, this beautiful thing called the Bible that we have, seems to point to that truth, what Jesus stood for and represents it. And so there does seem to be, for us as a people of God, one direction, and we call it the gospel. The one direction that you and I are called to live for and point towards, the one direction that we play is towards the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus Christ. And Paul actually identifies it in this text in verse 11 through to verse 14. Let me read it to you again. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. This is the gospel. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us, to save us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Paul says this is the gospel. The good news of what Jesus has done for us, Paul points to a grace that saves unworthy people, that gives them a new heart, plays in one direction, a heart that plays for God, away from self and away from the world, plays towards God and causes them to behave and live differently, to live in and for Christ. And then there's a little subtle, little quiet reminder here that Jesus will return while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. And so Paul is saying this gospel is not just now orientated, it's also pointing to the future, kind of saying we live in such a way that we're waiting for Jesus to come back. We're in that sense, there's the parable of, the, of waiting for, at the wedding, waiting for the bride and the groom to come. There's a sense of eager expectation. Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, I want to be ready. That's the direction we're playing towards. The gospel changes the way we live. We're just meant to live differently. When, you, when you're playing in this one direction, this gospel direction, then your whole life looks different. I was just reflecting on some ways that that maybe can play out for me. It means that in my neighborhood, I want to be the guy that pays my domestic worker and my gardener more than anybody else. That's what I think it looks like to be, to be someone who's flavored by the gospel. I just pay good wages more than just bare minimum. That's what it means like in my neighborhood. It, it means in my neighborhood that I'm going to hold really good fun parties but that are wholesome and don't involve drunken revelry. For me, it's at work, it, treating my workers with dignity and respect. That yes, I might be the boss, I might be over them, but I treat them fairly, and I treat them like human beings, speak to them like human beings. I'm a, a boss that teaches my people to have a balance between work and home. I don't, I was talking to, we have, a, we have a guy who lives on our property, and he was saying to me, his boss is a workaholic, and he knows that if he doesn't work from half six in the morning till half six at night, he's gonna get fired. You're only supposed to work eight-hour days, but there's this unwritten law that's just there. And, and he's, he sussed this out. The people who work while the boss is there, they keep their jobs. They have favor. That's unhealthy. It's unbalanced. This poor, this poor guy works 60-hour weeks most weeks. That's not gospel flavoring. If there's teenagers here, you're, you're the kid at school. It's fun to be around, but you don't participate in activities that dishonor your parents or where that lacks self-respect. It's when there's a need in your community, on your community WhatsApp group, you're the first one to put up your hand on the group and say, I can help. I can go on and on, but the gospel flavors our relationships. 
It, repla- it, re- it kind of transforms the way we treat the people around us. It shapes our actions and our reactions. I think often the way we react to stuff says more about who we are than our actions. Do you know what I'm talking about? Our reactions often say more than our actions. So <laughs> a while ago, one of our neighbors treated one of my boys really disrespectfully. Like, really? I wouldn't give you the details of it, but it's like I was blown away that someone would treat a child in this way. And so I just wanted to go over there, climb over the wall. There's a wall's only about this high between them, and then just give them a piece of my mind. And fortunately, I didn't, because we've since really built a good relationship with the neighbor. But I just gave it some time. I actually spent like three days processing this and praying about it, and eventually went over there and had an opportunity. And we had a good, honest chat, and they apologized. And we're great neighbors since then. But I know that if I had reacted at that moment, it, it would have been unhelpful and it would not have been a good witness because I know I'm a pastor. <laughs> so it would not have been great. And so we, part of it is the way we deal with discord in our lives, our reactions. Church, play in a gospel direction in every facet of your life. That's the first thing that Paul says to Titus. You need to coach this little community. And it's true for us here today. The second is, play hockey. As the coach says, play hockey. Well, what does that mean for us? Uh, And of course, that little church increase. Well, the key is found in verse 14. Just literally four words, a people for himself, it says there. A people for himself. Jesus has set apart a people for himself. We are to be a people set apart for Jesus. That's that's our hockey. That's That's our game. It's to live for Christ. We're called Christians, which means Christ ones, people who belong to Christ. I love C.S. Lewis. You know that I quote him often. Two quotes for him. Now, the whole offer which Christianity makes is this. He says, the whole offer that Christianity makes is this. That we can, if we let God have his way, come to share in the life of Christ. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is something, nothing else. The whole point of being a Christian, he says, is nothing else except becoming a little Christ. And then <clears throat> in another book he says, the church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Jesus, to make them little Christs. There's the term again, little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself, was simply a waste of time. How's that for a statement? So all this that we've got going on here, this elaborate setup, lots of staff, big budget, it counts for nothing, C.S. Lewis says, if it's not making us little Christs, turning us into Christ's people. Little Christs. Love the language. Last weekend, my sister got married. Last Saturday, I had the double privilege of walking her down the aisle, handing her over, and then turning around and leading the ceremony. It was quite special for me. I think that's a first. I've never been to a wedding where that's happened before, maybe somewhere. But that was really, really special. But of course, it was a whole weekend together, and of course, I've got three teenage boys. Uh, so the conversation drifts to who each boy looks most like. Uh, so yeah, the one supposedly looks a lot like me, poor child. Uh, the other one looks a lot like my brother-in-law, one of Liesl's brothers, and the other one looks a lot like my mom-in-law's family, and so there was some disagreement and conversation about it, and it was a bit fun. I did feel sorry for uh, uh, the boys as they listened to this conversation. We did come to one agreement, though, is all the good traits come from Liesl and the bad traits come from me. <laughs> so everyone agreed on that one. So It's a fun conversation, but ultimately I look at my boys I don't want someone to look at their lives, and I get emotional even when I think about it. I want my, people to look at my boys and say, yeah, he's a lot like his dad. I want them to look at my boys and say, yeah, they remind me so much of Jesus. It's like a, it's like a burning thing in my heart. That's what I want people to say about my boys. They, they're aiming too low if they're going to be like me. We're aiming way too low. I want them to look like Jesus. I want them when they're adults, people to be drawn to them because of Christ in their lives. It's our biggest task as parents. My biggest job, yes, I've got to feed them. 
clothe them. I've got a kid going off to university. I've got to put them through a big, big education. But to be honest, if those are the focuses, it's like playing rugby on a hockey field. It's, it's messy. It's not going to work. And as parents we, and grandparents, we get it wrong sometimes. We've just got the wrong focus. It's not an education. It's not setting them up for their futures. It's part of it. It's primarily and completely and utterly about helping our little ones, you guys this morning, helping our kids find Jesus and allow Jesus to shape and change their lives. Look like him, little Christs. That's the game. And thirdly and lastly, don't hit anyone. <laughs> Text is full of it. Don't slander. Love your family. Be kind. Don't talk back. Text is littered with little references about how we treat each other. In Jesus' language, love. Love one another. New Testament is full of one another passages which just speak about who we are as the people of God. That the thing that defines us, that sets us apart is our love for one another, the way we treat each other. I remember I was a young Christian, uh, probably about, I don't know, maybe about 19 or 20. And this statement one of the preachers said that stuck with me. Sometimes, I probably listen to 10,000 sermons, but there's little one-liners that sometimes stick. And this person said that the Christian army is the only army that shoots its own wounded. I was horrified by that statement. It was kind of saying that we are not always very kind and loving to each other as the people of God. And yet, Scripture is full of the fact that we are God's people and the very character trait of God that is most definitive is he's a loving and a good God. And if we are his people and he's put his spirit in us, then we are a, to be a loving people. We are to be a loving people. We are to love one another well. In fact, scripture seems to indicate that if we can't love each other well, then we just don't love God. The Bible says that. C.S. Lewis again. Do not waste your time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you loved someone, you will presently come to actually love them. So he's kind of saying, stop thinking about I should be loving my neighbor and I've got to have a feeling towards them and a warmth towards them. Just love them. Treat them with love and respect. Look around you. Is there anyone here in this building that you need to just make a decision to love? Someone in this church family, in your own family, in your space of work? Is there anyone that you just need to, that's tough at the moment, you don't love them at all? You don't have any warm, fuzzy feelings towards them? Think of someone. I know you, I know you can. Choose to love them. Let's begin to draw this a little bit to a close. Where's the best place to play in this gospel direction, become little Christs and love one another? I think the best place is in our homes. Titus was leading a home church. They met in homes. We call them life groups or connect groups. Best place for community to begin to unfold, for us to be the people of God, is in homes. And then he directs women to disciple, older women to disciple younger women. Older men disciple young men. It even says, slaves disciple your masters. <laughs> Love that in Scripture takes place in the home, this text seems to be saying. Home is where our faith is best shaped and lived out. We need other gospel relationships, but home is where we live the most real and, and the most honest lives. Home is the best reflection of the state of our hearts. We learned two weeks ago that leaders, before you appoint them, look at their home life. It starts with the home. We can run the best possible Sunday service here with, with good teaching, Make lots of resources available to you, but the shaping of your hearts happens in homes. And so as we gather in homes, in life groups and connect groups, and as families, we learn to love God and each other. And the vehicle to love God and each other is called discipleship. The goal is to love God and one another more, but the vehicle to get there is called discipleship. Now, we've been talking a lot about discipleship in the last few months and a couple of people have said to me, what do you mean by discipleship? Let me just give you a, a very short one-liner. Discipleship is growing in our love for Jesus and helping others to do the same. Can I say that again? Discipleship is growing in our love for Jesus and helping others to do the same. 
of everything that we do that nurtures our connection with God and then finding ways to help the people around us also connect with Him. That's discipleship. So I've asked two of the elders just to come forward and just share a little bit about what discipleship looks like in their homes. So we've got Sean and we've got Liesl. Liesl and Johan are a couple together. They're elders as a couple, but Liesl's been delegated to, to come and speak. And Sean and Mish. Mish was one who welcomed us into the service this morning, just two great families. They are amazing, but they're imperfect. And I hope that comes out this morning, uh, that they are, uh, knowing Sean, it definitely will. Uh, but they I know as two families, and they're two elder families, which I, I think a lot of people have said to me lately, who are our elders? So it's also just a way of introducing you to them. Tell us a little bit about what your family discipleship uh, looks like. You can start, Liesl, and then you can pass the mic uh, to that side. It's messy. <laughs> So I think, yeah, I mean, I was thinking about the question, and we probably just fumble through it most of the time. Um, but I think for me, it starts with m my relationship with God. Because if I don't have a good relationship with God, and I don't spend the time in the Word, and I don't pray a heck of a lot for my kids, then I've got nothing. So that's kind of where it starts. And then secondly, um, so in Deuteronomy 6, it says that you need to, you know, firstly, have the commands in your heart. And then secondly, teach it to your children and in your, in your walking and in your sitting and in your lying down. And, and um, I know that, that, you know, life is busy, but for us, it's literally saturating everything of life and just pointing the kids to, to Jesus all the time, no matter what they go through. And, and even in our mistakes, you know, being humble enough to say, sorry, guys, I, I, I did that wrong. Um, you know, and I apologize and ask for forgiveness. But you know, I, I think it's, it's that being intentional about pointing them to Jesus, whatever they, whatever they go through. But, but for me, firstly, to, to sit with God and go, help, because I'm also just a kid. So you've got your own devotional life, and then as family, do you guys sit around the table at dinner or in the morning before you get up? Or? You know, so things, things are different. When your kids are younger, it's, it's, it's easier because you can go, thou shalt sit down and listen to the sermon. Mm. Um, when, when they're older, they all, and everybody's got their own schedule. So we used to, as a family, sit every single night and read the Word and work through the Bible. But now when the kids are, are older, you know, they, they run into their room. So we try and get together at least twice a, um, twice a week, okay. and we work through... Um, uh, through the Word. It's an app where it basically takes a, a book of the Bible and um, there's, a, there's an audio guide through the Scripture. So it takes a, a chapter and it works through the... And we'll talk about it. We'll okay. go, what stands out for you? And, and through we'll, the Word. It's called Through the Word. Through the word. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, fantastic, it's okay. a fantastic app. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Cool. I think maybe I must start off by saying we have it easier. <laughs> well, easy. We, we only have one daughter, Sadie, and she's seven years old, so we can tell her to sit down and listen. Um, and they say it wait, takes... Wait, just wait. <laughs> Uh, it takes a village to raise a child, and we are really lucky. Like, we have a village around us, so we have um, a lot of people who help us with this. So that's just my first uh, <laughs> whatever... Um, T's and C's. <laughs> so we did ask Sage. Mish said, uh, so why don't we ask her how we're we doing? And she told Mish, uh, we don't read the Bible a lot and we never teach her about Jesus. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> so we definitely don't have it perfect and we realize we're definitely not getting her on stage here because that's going to be really bad for us. Uh, but we have tried to make it quite, and maybe part of that is we've tried to make it quite natural, yeah, quite normal. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about maybe some of the prayer stuff. Yeah, so I, at first I kind of had a little giggle about that, and then I thought, well, maybe I'm going to see that as a positive, that we're not doing it in such a way that we're like, come, now we're going to talk about Jesus. It's just so flavored in our everyday life that she doesn't even realize, you know, we're teaching her about it, so I think, I think we do teach her. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't know it yet. Uh, for me, the one thing is that um, I, I pray a lot with her, or we pray a lot, and we've really encouraged her from little, so... Uh, we've always been involved in a church and up front, and she's always watched us. Uh, so it's a little bit of mimicking it. Um, as a as a two, three-year-old, she'd be up front with her hands in the air, you know, maybe not even realizing what she's doing, but she's watching us, and, and she's copying us. And um, one of those things that I've, uh, I always feel like when we're in a space where life feels out of control, that we pray. And so I just say in that moment right there, cool, let's pray about it. 
or and it, it can be um, I want to say silly things, but small things. We drive past an accident scene, and we can't stop and help. But she's curious and what's going on. And as we drive, we just say, "Let's pray. Let's pray for the people in the car." If we hear an ambulance siren, mm. we say, "Let's pray." And it, it was so awesome to see her then starting to do that. So we were somewhere one day, and I didn't even notice the ambulance siren. She came running to me. And she, said, "Mommy, we got to pray." And and we prayed, Very and cool. uh, we were in Canal Walk. And we were walking past, and, and we walked past a lady in a wheelchair. Again, I, was, <laughs> I didn't even notice. And after we walked past, she was squeezing my hand, and I said, what's wrong? And she said, I want to pray for that lady. Mm. And so it's just little things. Like when you're just doing it, mm. they're picking it up. So maybe it's just, yeah, that from mm. my side, that. And then just one of the, uh, I'm a routine person and a habit person, so one of the things we've started, which is awesome, I cannot recommend it highly enough, is, you know, we, we often talk about the Lectio 365 app, which is the daily devotion thing that you can get on your phone. There's a family one now for, like, kids kind of under the age of 12. Mm. Both of them are amazing, but this, uh, that one is perfect for us. So pretty much every day, it's like less than 10 minutes. Mm. Scripture, little prayer time, little question. Uh, so we do that with her. Now she can read, so she reads it as well as, as the kid. Mm. Um, and it just gives us so much stuff to talk about. And ideally what we're aiming is to close that off at the end of the day. If we can get around that table and go, hey, how was that? We spoke mm. about forgiveness. How did that play out at school and stuff like that? So oh. it's a really good rhythm just to try every day. Yeah. Thank you. Lecture 365. Excellent. Thanks, guys. There's some helpful tools. They're going to be around afterwards. Uh, I'm sure most of us, like me, are not great at family devotions. You're going to want to talk to them. Just write down the different apps that they've spoken about, and I think I just want to begin to draw it to a close. Time's up. It starts at home for all of us. This playing in the same direction, this <laughs> learning to love, uh, this little Christ that we're growing into, it starts at home, whether it's in a life group or a connect group or you as family devotions, doesn't matter how young or old you are, it starts at home. And my prayer out of today is that you're going to have something stirring within your heart, something tweaking, something nudging you, that if this, this is not part of who you are at the moment, that you're going to start this week. And you heard it's messy. You get it wrong more than you get it right. But there's something that God does with us, like clay, when we begin to put ourselves in His hands. He takes that little bit that we offer, and He transforms us into a beautiful people of God. Let's pray together. Lord, it's been a special time just in Scripture this morning. You love these people deeply. This is your family. This is your church, Jesus. Each of these people sitting in front of me this morning, you, you love them with all the passion that took you to the cross. And your longing and your desire is that they just find you in greater fullness, that they get to hear your voice in their life, that they get to sense the work of the Spirit. This is your longing for each of them, Lord. And so I just want to bless them this morning, this people of God. And just like that little church in Crete, you took them up and you raised them up into a people that just look different to their neighbors. I pray that this congregation would look different because of what you're doing in our lives. Help us to look more and more like you. Help our kids to look more and more like you, that Jesus can be made magnificent because you are worthy of all praise. Amen. Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.